How's it going, everybody? Welcome to the Music Production Podcast. This is the show where we talk about making music and all of the things that go with it, that complicated task that sounds so much easier than it really is. I'm your host, Brian Funk, and today my guest is David Abravanel. And David has, I guess, I came, we came together over um, as you work with Ableton, um, but you're also working for Sensel now. You are a journalist. You've written for the Ableton blog, CDM, and a bunch of others. Um, scoring film soundtracks, a musician, a plug-in hoarder. Um, all around nice guy, I would say too, from our interactions. Oh, thanks, so, man. <laughs> nice to have you here. Finally, we got to work this out. It's, I'm glad yeah. you were able to make it. No, it's great. Yeah, I mean, as you mentioned uh, back when I was uh, at Ableton, you know, you're a certified trainer and uh, very active with sharing racks and tips and tricks and stuff. And uh, one of the things that I loved is that when we met in person for the first time at Brooklyn Synth Expo recently. I had no idea who you were until you said your name because I was so used to just seeing you with the sunglasses in the video. <laughs> yeah. So it was like, oh, oh yeah, we've been talking for 10 years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. those events are funny because you see all these people like in 3D all of a sudden and they're just usually on your computer screen. And mm -hmm. um, I, I had a similar experience with you. I went to the table and I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> the world's collided, the uh, yeah, virtual totally. and the real. <laughs> That was what, the Brooklyn Synth Expo, right? Yeah, yeah, that was uh, the Brooklyn Synth Expo a couple months back, yeah. which was great, and man, that's grown. Uh, I mean, I remember sure going a, a couple years ago to the Stompbox and Synth Expo, and as I recall, it was just the kind of main showroom at Main Drag Music for one yeah. day. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this year it's this big warehouse studio venue for two full days and foot traffic of, I think, over 3,000 people or something. Really, oh, wow. a lot, yeah. Wow, that's excellent. Yeah, this yeah. the venue was nice this year. Um, the year before was a little rough. It was very hot and like a sort of underground Brooklyn mm -hmm. basement type of thing. Um, but yeah, it's just uh, those things though are as much fun as they are. There, it's a little bit of torture too. <laughs> it's yeah, everything you could like ever possibly want, and you you, you know you you definitely are putting yourself through a little bit of a little a little uh, I don't know. Just uh, seeing all this fun stuff to play with. It's exciting and also, oh my God, overwhelming. It happens every year that there's something like that. I mean, you know, with any trade show, I mean, especially every time I'm at NAM, there's always something that I kind of look at and I think, oh, if only I could just take that home right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this last year it was the uh, the, the Korg Volca Modular, which I did end up getting, uh, you know, a little bit after, but they didn't have any to spare that I could buy off them or take home there. Right. So it was, uh, you know, there's always just something incredible that's just not yet ready for prime time or the public. Yeah, I saw you making some use of that vocal modular on your Instagram mm -hmm. account, having some fun with it. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, uh, I've i probably, I, I don't know if there's any other company on earth that I've given as much money to than, than Korg. Hmm. Uh, I've got, I mean, the first synthesizer I ever bought when I was a teenager was a micro Korg and I still have it. I still use it. It's a beautiful synthesizer. Um, my tuner's a Korg. I've got five of the Volcas now, I guess. Three Monotrons, the Monotribe, um, the Legacy Collection software gadget on my iPhone. I mean, they just, they have my number. Everything yeah. they make is great, I think. So, yeah, and it's all, it all finds its way into my work. So, yeah, they are on a fun tear lately. I'm just, Everything they're coming out, I'm just like, oh my god! Even, even the apps are, are awesome, and um, oh you know, yeah, you know with the new um, this. Uh, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the new polyphonic synth they came out with the the in, mini log. The, yeah, the 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 prolog now, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. I mean, That's that, yeah. That thing is like, woo! That, that looks fun. Yeah, <laughs> I, I got to play on one of those. Um, I think it was actually last year at the Synth Expo. Mm. And and I I put up with the uh, sweaty headphones just to enjoy <laughs> the uh, the sounds coming out of that thing. No, it's great. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's uh, they really know what they're doing. It's very nice stuff. Mm. So, yeah. So yeah, you've got your yourself involved in like a lot of the the cool companies out there. Uh, maybe oh, you thanks. can break it down for us. Tell us what you've done, what you're doing, and uh, we'll take it from there. Really, there's there's a lot of fun places we can go. Yeah. So, I mean, I've always been really into music, uh, electronic music making. Um, it kind of, there, there's a story that I like to tell that goes back to when I was around eight years old. 
And my sister made me a cassette copy of the best of Erasure that she had. Hmm. And what I said to my parents at the time, which my mother remembers and made her laugh a lot, was, oh, they take advantage of their instruments. Like, that was the only way that I could describe <laughs> synthesizers that I was hearing and what Vince Clark was doing. Um, but I've always just kind of had a thing for electronic music and for music in general. Um, I, you know, I took piano, trumpet, and guitar as a child. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I guess around the time I was in college, um, I took a few courses in electronic music making and spent some, a lot of time doing a deep dive with Super Collider, which is a great uh, language for electronic music, um, and got into Ableton Live um, and, uh, you know, started writing for a few outlets at that time, uh, The Milk Factory, Pop Matters, and Coke Machine Glow. Mm. Um, and all of that kind of led to post-college, I ended up working in social media marketing, which was a really new field at that point around, you know, 2009, 2010. Uh, and from that, it just happened that Ableton was looking for a community and social media manager. They needed that position to start happening. So I joined them in 2010. Um, and then I was in, I lived in Berlin from 2010 to 2014, uh, working with Ableton, doing social media and community, and then also doing, uh, and, you know, writing a lot and kind of doing some product marketing work and as part of that marketing communications team. Um, then I joined a company called Gobbler in 2014 as their head of marketing as they were preparing to launch uh, a subscription service in tandem with uh, Pace, which still exists. Um, and then a year later, you know, what happened to Gobbler is what happens to, I think, a lot of startups. They just money happened. They let go of all the non-developers at once. And um, was that the, I mean, they've um, rebounded a bit since. But they kind what? of did like a DAW thing, right? Where gobbled was this the one that like gobbled up your files? Yeah. Cloud? So the original, yeah. so Gobbler originally was an app for collaboration. Mm -hmm. So it would do two things. One is, you know, it would kind of get everything on the cloud. So you didn't have to worry about where your files were locally in terms of recordings and whatnot. Um, and then the other thing actually was Gobbler 2.0. And I hate to say it, I don't actually know if they're still running it, but um, had a really good versioning system where every time someone saved, it would actually list it in the app as you know, this new person's version. So if you and a collaborator were working on something, it basically made saving the same project working with multiple collaborators a non-destructive process, hmm. which was fantastic because otherwise it's very hard if you're not in person with someone to get something done like that. Um, and then the other idea that they had that they were working on when I joined them basically was this, uh, was, was introducing subscription to plugins by partnering with uh, Pace with the people who make iLock and kind of, you know, bringing, in many cases, pro higher price plugins, making them more accessible to people via subscription. Hmm. So, um, yeah, so I did that for a year and then I left that in uh, late 2015 uh, and started freelancing. And I've been there since uh, for a number of different companies. Um, so, yeah, I mean, other music tech companies would be like Eventide or currently my major client is Sensel who makes uh, the Morph, which is this fantastic uh, touchpad, multi-touch interface with a bunch of different overlays, these rubberized overlays you can put on it. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, a number of other places. Uh, K Devices is another one I've done some work with. They've done some uh, great stuff for Max for Live. Um, and then some other clients who are also in kind of marketing tech and ad tech that aren't as relevant to this uh, <laughs> podcast. But <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it's been a fun adventure in uh, digital marketing and promoting stuff that I love and engaging communities. Mm. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And um, I, I think like, um, you know, especially like a company like Ableton has really worked the community side of things. And I think that's mm -hmm. probably a, a lot of um, their success is owed to that. You know, just... Oh, yeah. I mean, when I started using Live, uh, this is probably like around 2009, I think. And... um. One of the re things that sucked me into it was like there was just so much out there about it. There was, you know, I was using Logic. I was enjoying Logic quite a bit, but um, all the stuff around Live was just like great. There were there were just so many tutorials, so many communities to tap into, that it really made you want to use it more. There was just so much information out there, and that's that's obviously grown incredibly now since um, you know we we have Loop now and. We saw each other at Spaces in July. Yeah. Um, like a lot of really cool stuff. Um, no, Ableton has done a fantastic job with its community. And um, 
I mean, it's just really cool. I mean, I, I would say, you know, the, the people at Ableton just really love what they're doing and know what they're doing. And I'm, you know, continuously impressed by what comes out. And I continue to love using live. It's still kind of my main squeeze. I do have other DAWs and I will go to them for kind of different things. But, you know, the, the main axe on the computer is definitely still live. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm still in uh, contact with them and I still do a decent amount of writing and some product marketing stuff with them. But uh, no, I think what they've done with the community is fantastic. And they've really managed to set up these events like Loop and like the uh, Spaces event where it really just feels like a community gathering together. Mm. And that's one of the things that I love. Um, it doesn't feel like there's necessarily a ton of ego. It's more just everyone's there sharing what they're doing creatively and really excited about it. Um, and I always walk away with some interesting new connections and learning some really cool things and wanting to go home and try stuff out, you know, on my own laptop. It's great. Yeah, it's not like, um, and you can buy all of this now for, you know, right. it, it's, yeah. it's just about the actual like artists getting together. And mm -hmm. um, it's, I've always kind of wished uh, a lot of other things. I mean, like, for example, in my day job as a teacher, sometimes I just wish like they would just let us give us time to just all talk as teachers, share ideas. Yeah. And, and that's like really what they're doing very well, I think. Just creating that forum, that open space. Yeah. So, so that must have been fun to be involved in that and then watching that grow and being a part of that. Yeah, it was great. And it was a fun, you know, I mean, it was, look, it was a great time to be in Berlin too. I mean, it's, it's interesting living in New York now and uh, so many people I run into here talk about how their life's ambition is to move to Berlin to make techno music. Hmm. And, uh, you know, I try not to do the kind of like hipster holier than thou thing like, oh, I did that, whatever. <laughs> but, but it does feel like the vibe in Berlin circa 2011, 2012 is what some of these new venues in Brooklyn are going for and what some of the nights that people are hosting here are going for a little bit. Um, you know, I mean, and there was a lot of cool stuff there and there still is. I mean, Berlin's still an awesome place and I try to go back when I can. Um, yeah, I mean, I miss it certainly. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, no, it was, it was a great time to be there. And they're just, you know, there were a lot of great people around. There was a lot of great music going on. Um, yeah. Hmm. Well, I hope to make it out there for the next loop that I think is in April yeah. now. So, yeah, they announced it. It's uh, end of April, 2020. Yeah, that'll be my first adventure. In, in Florida, yeah, so. it's, well, and it overlaps with Superbooth. So that's going to be quite oh, really? a week in Berlin. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm trying to figure it out. I'm kind of figuring out the details right now with uh, other people at Sensel as well. Mm -hmm. to kind of figure out, you know, oh, okay, if we're going to go, this, you know, how do we divide and conquer that kind of thing? Yeah, is so, it like it's not the same weekend, is it? I think it is actually. I believe really? the days actually overlap. Whoa. There's there's one or two days where both are going on, which is yeah. So better get our tickets now. <laughs> get yeah, you know, it's kind of going to be it's almost like uh, electronic music week, like fashion yeah. week. Right. Um, wow. Like I made a joke a while back uh, when I lived in San Francisco in late 2015. There was a week that I referred to as a friend to a friend as like IDM week San Francisco because mm -hmm. it was the shows that week. It was uh, Autechre played uh, Monolake. Robert Henko was doing his um, his uh, laser show there. And then Mark Fell from SND was playing. And then there was another night, uh, the IDP that my friend Renzo does, uh, the Intelligent Dance Party in San Francisco. And uh, another uh, friend of mine, uh, Romulo from uh, Schematic Records in Phoenicia was playing that night. So it was just this embarrassment of like great glitch and IDM music that one week. Hmm. So sometimes these things just kind of happen, you know, they concentrate. Yeah. Well, that'll, yeah. Be, that'll be interesting. It, it seems <laughs> like it could be overload maybe, but I'm sure they'll, they'll make it work and it'll be cool. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, nice. And um, and uh, I told you before, I was just listening to some of your music on Bandcamp, mm -hmm. um, Dial oh, F. Yeah. Um, yeah. Kind of a nice uh, chilled out. Uh, you said it was done all with... Um, Virtual modulars, right? Yeah. So that basically was, uh, you know, in the fall and winter of 2018, I was getting into a uh, number of, I was just kind of going through virtual modulars. Um, you know, there was the beta of VCV rack, which is now out in 1.0. Um, there was the soft tube modular. Uh, there was Cherry Audio's voltage modular. 
and um, then Reactor and Max MSP and and I was just kind of going through you know these these interesting these environments and kind of letting things develop um, outside of a kind of timeline or DAW view and that became that album uh, Janus that I put out on January first of twenty nineteen. Um, yeah, so I mean that was you know that was just a lot of fun. I mean that was also I hadn't put out an album really in a while. I mean I actually I. I finished one in uh, 2015 that uh, has I've sent to a few friends, but it was a little more personal. It was a very interesting project uh, called Jewish Power Electronics, hmm. which uh, was uh, a really interesting genesis. And um, but yeah, this uh, the, the Dial F stuff, I just kind of wanted to get out there um, and I wanted to play more. That was kind of one of my New Year's resolutions. So then I also uh, played a show at Hollow that I recorded and put up there. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's kind of where that went. Um, yeah, it was nice to just kind of force myself to finish that stuff and get it out and have something thematically that, le- that linked all the pieces. Right. And it's available for free if anyone wants to go to dialf.bandcamp.com. Cool. We'll put that so. in the show notes. Yeah. Because uh, I think it's it's a nice thing. Like I had it just as I was uh, kind of hanging around before the, the podcast mm-hmm. was going. And it was nice. Put me in a good frame of mind, I think. <laughs> a lot of yeah, fun and sounds. If you ch- like and if you check it out on headphones, a couple of the tracks I tried mixing them binaurally um, mm-hmm. using the envelope uh, envelope for live plugins. So envelope is this ambisonic sound space in San Francisco that um, uh, an old friend of mine, Christopher Willits, and some other people uh, created. And uh, a couple of them, uh, Rama Gottfried and Roddy Lindsay, developed a series of Max for Live plugins for playing that sound system. It's a 28.4 grid of, uh, you know, ambisonic speakers, but the plugins can also bounce things down to binaural. So you can mix uh, three-dimensionally and live with them. And that was a really interesting thing to try out. So. Yeah, that, yeah. that's actually pretty interesting to, to the topic to get into. I haven't tried mm-hmm. that yet. That um, that's, I guess that's like a pack that came out. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, how does that change? How does that affect the way you put your music together? when you are mixing in that way is it it's interesting i find when i yeah when i work with it i tend to focus on fewer sounds and more space Mm -hmm. and also definitely uh i end up reducing the use of plugins that smear the stereo spectrum so not as many kind of uh stereo modulation plugins so not as many phasers or flangers not as much reverb necessarily or if it is it's a little bit shorter or more of an uh, of an ambience instead of a kind of you know lush swell, um, yeah. I mean, I, I think to me some of the gold standards in spatial audio. There was an album, it was either last year or 2017 that Suzanne Chani did that was a recording of her uh, quadraphonic performance. Mm-hmm. So I mean, she's been playing in quad since the 70s, and she's kind of a a grandmaster both of modular synthesizers, especially the Buchla ones, and of uh, spatial audio and um, Actually, the team that did that are both uh, uh, acquaintances of mine. It was it was recorded live by Vance Galloway and then mixed by Kamran V, who is a, a guy out of uh, L.A. who's kind of really just brilliant with spatial audio um, and whom I initially met actually at the the meetup at Loop last year in L.A. for spatialized audio. Mm. So, yeah. So I think, you know, I, I think, you know, you listen to Suzanne Chani's work and you think, oh, I really do hear where those sounds are placed and part of it is that she's not afraid to relax and let silence in. Um, one of the uh, professors of music at Wesleyan University where I went, Ron Quivla, was fond of saying that, that people need to not be afraid of silence, which I thought mm. was a really interesting thing to say, but especially with modern electronic music, I can really understand it, uh, you know, especially like with overcompression and that kind of thing. So yeah, I feel like when I do, when I mix spatially, I try to really let things stand out a little bit more. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense that you would need to give things space so that they can exist in their own space. Mm-hmm. And the temptation is definitely to add more, more, more. Well, my computer can handle 900 tracks. Right. So I ought to yeah. put them in. And and I think there's even like a belief that like you you don't have like a finished song until you have like more tracks than you can count. <laughs> right. Oh, no, totally. Well, you know, what was at the the most recent uh, Apple Developers Conference? They were demonstrating the new Mac Pro by opening a Logic set with a thousand tracks. Yes, I saw that. I mean, I'm glad that that's possible. That's cool, but 
I don't know how often do that. <laughs> yeah, how often do I mean, I can't think of a it's hard to think of an environment in which you would have 1000 tracks running simultaneously that doesn't just turn into white noise. Yeah. You know. <laughs> that yeah, many, eventually yeah. it all just takes over each other. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and and I think sometimes uh I mean, if you read a, a Tape Op magazine, one of the things that I think a lot of their writers and a lot of their interviewees are fond of saying is, you know, embrace what modern uh, software and technology can do for you, but learn from the past. And one of the things that I've tried to do, for example, is, you know, it's very easy with modern software to have 10 different tracks and have each track have a completely different reverb on it. Mm -hmm. And then you wonder, you know, you think, oh, it just sounds so digital. It sounds so fake. Uh, Whereas I find the more that you try to force yourself with delays and reverbs to put those on send tracks and have multiple tracks going to the same sends, it kind of glues a piece together a little bit better it sounds less overwhelming. Mm. I mean, sometimes you want the digital. Sometimes you want it to sound like you kind of sprayed Lysol on things. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, I think of stuff like uh, like uh, uh, like SND's album Atavism or the recent album on Dishon's Mego by this guy, Jung Antagen. Uh, sometimes you really want this kind of, you know, almost anesthetized, uh, clean digital sound. But often enough, you want it to kind of have more of a character to it. And that's one way to do it is with send tracks. As simple as it is, yeah, it gives it like a one place to be. Uh, that's that's yeah. something I'm always kind of like thinking about because, like back in the tape days, it sort of automatically had an environment because it had the noise of the tape and and it was on one thing. They were all on the one piece of tape, and a lot of times, if you overload one track, you hear it on the other track. It kind of like gets through a little bit. Oh yeah. And that just doesn't happen in digital. It's so separate. And by processing things differently and putting each thing in a different room in a different world, it, it, I think it even makes it more separate. And like you said, like that sometimes putting everything together through something like even, Mm -hmm. even just, um, a compressor, like the glue compressor or something like that. Oh yeah. Um, you can really just make it all feel like it's, together happening <laughs> and affecting each other. And and it's interesting, right? Because sometimes, you know, uh, sometimes you kind of wonder how certain people get certain sounds and then it turns out that it's not by adding something, it's by not doing something that you're doing. Mm. Um, you know, for for years I thought that uh, the, that all the Monolake albums had this incredible sense of space and, you know, like really being there in the moment. And um, one of the things that I had tried to do was to use compression better to kind of magnify sounds and whatnot. And I remember the first time I uh, hung out with Robert Henke in Berlin and then showed him one of my tracks. And the first thing he went and did was disabled a bunch of the compressors. He said, why do you need all this? Why do you have this on every channel? Why are you squashing the life out of everything? And then I realized, of course, when I saw what his sets looked like, oh yeah, he's letting everything breathe. You know, compression is very rarely used um, in the recording process for him. And that doesn't mean that you shouldn't use compression. There are, you know, cases... I mean, when I, you know, when I use like a a 909 sound, I always love to compress it. Um, But yeah, you know, just just to to bear in mind, like, why are you doing these things and maybe take them out or find other ways to get where you're going, that kind of thing. So it's interesting to think about. Yeah. and, And to think about learning from the past, like a lot of times your studio would only have one or two compressors that you could do for the whole mix and you're doing the whole mix. The mix was like, um, a live thing, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. I can remember bouncing my mixes down to like dat tapes, and it was I, I'd had like a notebook full of like my automation that I would have to do manually, <laughs> and it, it was a real consideration. Like, what a, I have this one, uh, you know, thirty six thirty Alesis compressor. What's gonna get compressed? I have to really make a an important decision here and now. You don't have to like really go through the thought of like, does this need a compressor? You can just be like, oh, I put a compressor on every track. It, I mean, I, I have it in live where when I start a new audio track, it has a channel strip with an with a high pass, a low pass, and a compressor. So it it's always tempting. What's there? Let's just you know turn oh, yeah. the threshold down and get some gain reduction going. <laughs> but it doesn't have to happen necessarily. Yeah, I mean, my default channel is often the uh, the Brainworks SSLE plugin. Mm-hmm. I just love those EQs, and I really just love you know having that shaping EQ on every channel. But yeah, it also gives you uh, the modeled SSL compressor on every channel, 
Um, and you know, it's, it's, yeah, you have to kind of exercise that restraint to not do it all the time. Uh, yeah, no, I'd absolutely agree. It's interesting that you mentioned the Alesis 3630. Um, I wrote an article about side chaining last year for Ableton, a kind of two part tutorial series. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting about that, and this is one of the things that I've always loved is, you know, there's so many modeled compressors out there and a lot of them are a lot of fun. I have a lot of compressor models. They're great, but it's interesting to real, to think about how some of the most iconic, you know, compression sounds that people go for are simpler than you would think. So for example, the first two Daft Punk albums, mm -hmm. the 3630 was the only compressor they had. So all of that kind of pumping the filter house sound, that was it. You know, they didn't, they didn't have uh, a Fairchild or a Yuri or a Teletronics compressor. It was all this budget, you know, the, the kind of the standard Elisa's 3630. Uh, or I also think of an interview with um, uh, Andy Stott where he talks about how his compressor is generally just the default Ableton one, mm -hmm. uh, just the one that comes in live. Um, yeah, or t uh, a time that I spoke with the guys from uh, Empty Set, and it was the same thing. You know, they have, there's one particular compressor they have. It's just this one hardware unit, but that's it. You know, it's not a bunch of different ones. They're just kind of using it very artfully. So I mm. thought that was really interesting. I, I like that. It's like a kind of reality check, you know, like mm -hmm. it's humbling too because you sort of realize like, oh, <laughs> they were able to do this really magical thing with like this thing that's either already in my DAW or in my studio and it's not, you, you know, when, when you hear about things that are made with like, the finest high-end gear it creates mm -hmm. this distance like okay well yeah, oh, no, yeah no wonder my track doesn't sound like that but when you hear that it was done with all the things that you already have <laughs> then it's kind of like mm -hmm. oh <laughs> there's this there's more to this thing than I've, I've realized and i've tapped into no absolutely i mean uh you know it's um it's interesting how music making process has become so democratized with the advances in computing power right uh you know, I uh, uh, in 2009, I remember I interviewed Kid 606 and we were talking about the, those kind of advances and how things are less mystified uh, than they used to be at the time. And he was all in favor of it. You know, he said people were complaining because they said, oh, I can hear the Ableton beat repeat plugin in Daft Punk's live 2007 album. And he said, no, that's great, because that means that there's no barrier to you being that in your bedroom. You know, yeah. go ahead and do that. Don't feel like you have to save up for hundred thousand dollars worth of you know studio equipment to get to that sound um yeah and i it, it's interesting you know because going back to daft punk again actually there was a a kind of snarky polemic blog post i wrote when they put out uh random access memories their last album uh because i i didn't like that the uh the promo material for it the press material for it really accentuated that they used only the best studios and only the best people and only the best gear and the most expensive. And I mean, it just, the focus didn't seem to be on the music as much as on how they made it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, look, as a, as a gearhead, I can kind of understand that. I get it. But at the same time, it kind of felt like, I don't know. I don't like it when people assert that their music is better because they spent more money to make it. Uh, to me, that's absurd and it makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think that, um, I, I do love that record, but um, I think that if that's like, you, you know, like who cares? Like you need a good song, mm -hmm. you know? The, yeah. You, you can pol you polish a turd all you want, you know? <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but it doesn't matter that the thing is really the song. And and it's, e it's easy to get caught up in that. And um, yeah, that's that's a funny comment about the beat repeat. I mean, really, the only people that know that are like nerds like us, and <laughs> and I mean, no one else cares. It's a cool effect. The first time I heard beat repeat, yeah. I was like, "Whoa, <laughs> this is great!" And um, so what? It's um, yeah. it is. I think that's empowering, though. When I when I find out that like I I have access to some of that stuff, or or wow, that's like what I do, or that's something I could do. That that that, that inspires me as an artist. Whereas I think like. Um, when it's something so far out of your reach, it's a little frustrating. Yeah, and it's also, I think, important to point out that this is nothing new. It's mm -hmm. just that we are able to spot it better than we used to be. You know, in the 80s, um, there are plenty of Prince and Michael Jackson productions that used preset sounds from the Synclavier, yeah. or the Synclavier, however people pronounce it. 
It's just that that was a, you know, an instrument that costs a hundred grand. So not many people had access to it to know what was going on. But does it make those songs any less classic? Not in the least. Yeah. You know, I mean, Sign of the Times, which is my favorite Prince album, is full of uh, stock Sinclair sounds, apparently. It's still one of my favorite albums of all time, and it's still brilliant. It doesn't matter what, you know, what he was using to make it or how much he tweaked certain sounds from digital synthesizers to me. Mm. So, yeah. And even on the more like affordable end of that, like you hear like some of those like electric pianos from the DX7 all over the 80s. Oh, yeah. And And the organ from the M1 is on so many classic house tracks. Yeah. I mean, it's like, uh, it's like, this is it. This is exactly how it came out of the box. And, so, oh yeah. So what? Who cares that Whitney Houston did that? She's Whitney Houston on top of yeah, that. <laughs> it's absolutely. That, yeah. Yeah. In fact, it's really cool if you open a DX7 and play the piano patch, and it suddenly sounds like the greatest love of all. It's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's so, fun, and it, it again, I I feel a connection with that. I don't feel like cheated or anything. It's, no. It's kind of a, uh, but I think, you know. It's we have a lot of defense mechanisms as musicians and artists, and you know, to protect our egos. And these are ways we can do it. Oh, they just use the preset. Like, <laughs> who cares? That's yeah. No, but listen. And, to the and there's some and there's some cheeky stories from the past of people doing that. You know, one of my favorites is uh, uh, Chris Carter from Throbbing Gristle was asked by a technology magazine in the '70s to provide a schematic for the gristleism, which was the kind of modified effects box that he'd built for the members of that band. And he provided it, but he purposely messed up some of the voltages. So people built them and they weren't working. And, you know, his quote retrospectively about it, he said, oh, you don't get something for nothing. You know, you got to try a little bit, which I thought was kind of cheeky. And, you know, and people have always done that. I mean, DJs in the 80s would, some of them would rip the labels off of their uh, of their kind of special rare records so that people didn't know what they were playing. Uh-huh. Um yeah, you know, it's, it's, uh, people used to be that way. And now it's like things just, I think people are a lot more open than they used to be. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I, you think of things that have, that have trickled out now and it's kind of like this used to be unfathomable. I remember when I first started making electronic music, you know, one of the things that people would talk about on all these forums like EM411, uh, was, you know, oh, you know, wouldn't it be cool to look at one of Autechre's Max patches, which is just so dorky. Um, <laughs> And, you know, there was one that they leaked at one point. And, and then also, you know, they, they leaked, they did this huge dump of all of the data from their MPC mono machine and machine drum from around the 2008 tour. And they just kind of let it out there for people rather than releasing a soundboard recording. It was more just, you know, do something like this yourself. Go for it. Mm. Why not? Um, you know, even Aphex Twin, who's of course kind of the king of, pranking and secrets and all these, you know, fanboys want to know what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, you know, he published a, a, a screencast of one of the tracks from Drux running in a tracker a few years ago. And it was just kind of this funny thing that was like, yeah, this is, this is how we did it. That's it. There you go. Mm. <laughs> so. Yeah. I think like uh, there is more of a willingness to share, you know, you can get, mm-hmm. sometimes you get like their actual project files or the stems yeah. or, you know, they'll talk about the exact piece of gear they used. I, th- I think personally, um, if you take um, a, a technique or, or a sound and you like guard it as like your secret sauce, I, th- mm-hmm. I think that like um, inhibits you in a lot of ways. And it's almost like a way of telling yourself that I'm only able to do this because I know this little secret. And if it gets out, you know, I'm ruined kind of thing. And, oh yeah, um, and eventually people are going to figure it out. Yeah, um, I mean, there's there's a great story going back actually to Prince again of because uh, he was good at programming synthesizers, and he one of his early tours was opening for Rick James, and Rick James felt that he had been upstaged a few nights by Prince, and so kind of as retaliation, he used I guess a bunch of Prince's synth presets on his next album, hmm. um, <laughs> and that was supposed to be this cheeky thing, but you know, it doesn't, it doesn't make, it doesn't mean that there was any less of a genius to what Prince was doing that someone else happened to use the presets that he'd programmed. Right. Mm. You know? Um, and the same thing I think goes with anyone who's really brilliant technologically, you know, there's, there's more to it than just, uh, the programming prowess. There's, there's something unique to it. Um, one of the things that I've 
often recommended to people because I think it's a great exercise that I do all the time is to try and cover tracks that you really like uh, and try to cover them as precisely as you can because you're never going to do it perfectly. Mm -hmm. uh, and in doing it imperfectly, you're going to discover some new techniques that are uniquely your own. Um, you know, I remember when I first got Ableton Live and there's a version of it somewhere on SoundCloud. One of the first things I did just to get my head around it was I covered an Autacker track, Calpol, Able uh, uh, Calpol Introl, I called it Calpol Able Troll because I was being stupid. And, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and of course I didn't get it totally perfect, but in trying to model that sound design, I wrapped my head around a lot of the instruments that were in live mm -hmm. and a lot of what was going on in suite. And, you know, you figure out your own techniques that way. So it's a good exercise, I think. And it gives you, you know, and basically what it does is it takes the kind of melodically creative or the, the kind of percussion, you know, pattern designing creativity, that burden out of your mind. Yeah. And you can focus on just, you know, actually completing something and going through that process. Mm. So that's a good point. Well, it's yeah. funny that, you know, we don't do that as much with electronic music, but if you were learning mm -hmm. guitar, like, I mean, the oh, first yeah. thing I did, I learned all these Nirvana songs. I learned how to play the bands that I liked. And it it was like, of course, that's what you do, right? But oh, yeah. With like a sound G design. and an A chord is, Jane says, right there. That was the yeah. first song I learned on guitar. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you you don't really do that as much in the electronic world for whatever reason. Um, just try to recreate what they do. But yeah. I, I've done that once or twice, really, only. And it was a really valuable experience to just go through it and just see if I can figure it out. And like you said, it does lead you down different paths, stuff you wouldn't think of, and you got to get creative to find new solutions. Um, oh, yeah. And sometimes coming up with the melodies and the song structures gets in the way of that process. So that's a, that's a good point that it gets you through like other parts of the whole exercise of creating a track with you well, know, are well, you familiar with um uh the residence album third Reich and roll mm -mm. oh it's one of my favorite albums um let's write it down and uh, it's a crazy title and the 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 artwork is basically they put dick clark's face on nazi propaganda it's really weird uh but what they did with it is they recorded their own instrumentation and singing over a bunch of pop hits from the 50s and 60s and then took the original tapes away so that they were just left with what they had done. Oh, okay, cool. And it, it, it becomes this incredible exercise in kind of reinterpreting that whole era. And um, I mean, I feel like we've got stuff in the spirit of that in electronic music right now. I mean, every week, you know, the Boomcat Email Digest has some new, you know, post-rave, deconstructed rave, whatever type material that's coming out. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, directly addressing that stuff can have really interesting uh, results. Mm. Um, I mean, well, there was a really good compilation a few years ago also when, when Footwork was really big where they got a bunch of Footwork musicians to do their versions of trance classics, which was really interesting. So, you know, the melodies by and large kind of stayed the same, but the percussion because it's Footwork was very different and very intricate. And that was a really interesting exercise too. Mm. So, yeah, I'm all in favor of that, you know, kind of repurposing culture and remixing and that kind of thing. Yeah, it's, it's I guess, like you know, a cousin of sampling and a cousin of mm -hmm. the cover song and all, totally. all that stuff that we are very familiar with. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So um, you confessed you are a, uh, and, and this is kind of interesting too, because um, you've gotten a chance to work with a lot of cool companies that do this stuff, but you're a bit of a plug-in hoarder. Yeah. Um, you're very fascinated by like what's new, what's exciting. Mm -hmm. um, what's on your mind these days? What are you enjoying? Oh man. Um, <laughs> so, so one thing I would, uh, oh gosh, there's a, there's a lot of really cool stuff going on right now. Um, so in terms of kind of what's new and what's really interesting to me. So, you know, it's interesting. I mentioned earlier that I like to compress 909s. Uh, one of the ways that I like to do it actually is there's a great plugin that Eventide was developing when I was, uh, consulting with them and which is still, they're promoting now Fission. Uh, spelled P-H-Y-S-I-O-N, but not pronounced Fijin, Fission. Uh, and it really is this incredible uh, plugin in that you basically, it, it's spectrally, it separates tonal and transient material. So it's like the cleanest, 
most futuristic kind of transient designer ever, but it lets you apply different effects to each. So one of the things that I really like to do is, you know, when I like the sound of a beefed up overcompressed 909, but I don't like to have to sacrifice the transients. And previously, the only way to kind of do that was transient plugins that were based on dynamics. Um, since this one is based on what happens spectrally, it's just much cleaner and, and better sounding to me. And I kind of will just throw that on any 909 or any electronic drums that I want to have that kind of compression sound. It just works, you know, to compress the tonal material while leaving the transients alone. Mm. Uh, it's really great. Um, you know, and then there are other uh, plugins that are also just doing fascinating things. Um, there's a couple plugins that are working really interestingly with concatenation. So one is uh, one is called Mosaic by Echobit, and uh, it's a pretty affordable plugin. I think it's like 15 bucks, um, and it's a couple friends of mine uh, at that company, Echobit. And it's basically, you know, you just input the material and you specify a bunch of different rules, and it matches things to a corpus. So basically, whatever whatever you specify as the corpus, it can be any set of sounds. It will try and match from the incoming sounds. So if you want to whistle and see what sounds are closest in tonality and in volume uh, and from a 909 set, you can do that. You know, it's, it's all this weird stuff that you can do. Or if you want to play the piano and have that turn into bird song, you can do that mm. too. Um, and then there's another one that does that that's kind of a more advanced sound design plugin uh, from Crotus Audio called Reformer Pro, which allows you to morph between different sound libraries and does a lot with that as well and is great for kind of, uh, I mean, it's fantastic if you're a sound designer working on film or video games, but it's also just excellent if you just need inspiration for the sounds you're working with. Um, I would also say uh, anything that Sign Vibes puts out is always super futuristic. Uh, that's Artemy Pavlov and he's just brilliant. Um, you know, he's really good with wave folding. He actually designed the, uh, the kind of West Coast style oscillator that's in the prologue. Uh, that's available for that now for the Chord Prologue. And uh, the plugins that he does are always just doing really interesting things. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, there's a lot of small companies out there that are kind of anchored by one or two people who just have an obsession with something that's really interesting. Like um, if you look at a company like Valhalla DSP, uh, Sean Costello, the founder there, just has this wonderful obsession with reverb and with spatialization. And it comes through in these beautiful reverb and delay plugins. Um, or Madrona Labs, uh, Randy Jones, his stuff is just fantastic. Um, you know, the, the Alto and Kaivo synthesizers and the Verta effect. Um, they really do these things that are, you know, very few other instruments really do it, especially Kaivo, which is kind of this hybrid of uh, sampled synthesis, granular synthesis, and physical modeling, and just allows you to design these really otherworldly sounds that always kind of do something interesting. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and then, uh, gosh, I mean, there's just a lot. There's always a lot. <laughs> yeah, there are. Yeah. I, a lot of them I've never heard of. I wrote them down. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, and yeah. One or two I don't think I fully understood <laughs> either with <laughs> the bird song one yeah. you were talking about. Um, oh, it, yeah. That was Mosaic, yeah. you said. Um, yeah, so, well, so concatenation is basically, you know, it's like if you were to describe... Um, if you were to say what makes a human singing similar to, I don't know, a wood twig snapping, like how do you match that? Like if I were to give you a set of 10 samples of wood twigs and then a recording of a human singing and saying, okay, at any point, tell me which wood twig snapping sound matches this the most. I mean, it's kind of this crazy question because you're thinking, okay, well, how do I match it? Do I want to match it based on tonality, based on you know, uh, how bassy it is based on high frequencies, based on how noisy it is, based on amplitude. Mm. And so what Mosaic lets you do is specify that to match these sounds together. So it's basically very advanced uh, triggering of sounds. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's a process that hasn't seen as much love because it's, it, you know, it used to be much more CPU intensive, but now that processors can handle it better, it's, you know, we're, we're seeing more plugins that can do it. So... Might be a hard one to market too, you know. Yeah, just like uh, what do you sometimes um, like, like sometimes when I put out my packs, mm -hmm. like I'm like I I think it's like really cool, but I don't know how the hell to explain it to people, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I did this one called Spiral that um, I used Ableton's Looper, and I just played like single notes on different instruments, and then I had to go backwards, and so you wind up mm -hmm. with this like 
huge textured looping thing that I put inside of Sampler. And you play it back and it's just all these weird, interesting sounds. But I, it, it's probably like one of my least successful packs. But I think it's because I just don't know how to explain why it's cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, so like, yeah. like what you're saying with this one, it, it sounds very interesting. But like, you know, it's not like um, some of the more obvious like commercial things that mm -hmm. come out. And it's like really you, you understand exactly what it does in like a sentence maybe. Well, and that's, you know, and it's interesting that you bring that up because um, I think, uh, so I think back, uh, 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 Stefan Goldman, uh, who's a really great uh, uh, musician, wrote a book a few years ago called Presets, Digital Shortcuts to Sound, which was a collection of, in of interviews with people about the concept of presets. And one of the people he spoke to was uh, Mike Dalliott, who worked on, um, who worked on a number of plugins for native instruments, most notably Massive, which was a huge success. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that he talks about is that, you know, he had designed Massive as kind of a thing for the sound design nerds to really get involved in, but it took off because EDM people got into it. And that made me think of another Native Instruments product, uh, Razor, when they announced Razor for Reactor, and the video was all kind of these complexro sounding wubs, you know, and wobbles, whereas opening it up, it was this incredibly advanced additive synth that I, I love using. I mean, it's one of my favorite synths still, Razor. Um, but it's, you know, they had to figure out some way to market it, right? Yeah. You have to figure out some way to present it to people. Um, and that's difficult. And it's interesting because that's one of the challenges that I like most in music tech. Um, I've often called myself a nerd whisperer before, <laughs> which is to basically take very dense, complex concepts and figure out how to present them to people without dumbing them down, but also without kind of going over someone's head. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes there are technologies that are, you know, that are new enough or kind of unused enough that they're not quite ready for, for that yet. And I think it's interesting to see the stabs that people are taking at it. Um, but yeah, I would say, you know, for concatenation, I would look at something like the Crotos Audio Reformer Pro plugin as, you know, they're trying to present it more to sound designers as a way to get otherworldly sounds or new inspiration, that kind of thing. But eventually, you know, someone will crack that nut about presenting it to everyone, mm -hmm. you know? Um, might take like yeah. a hit to come out that uses it. And then yeah. Sound like, yeah. you know, sound like a uh, dial F, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah. I mean, how many people bought, uh, you know, how many people buy plugins because certain producers say they're using them? I mean, yeah. uh, uh, a friend of mine makes a really interesting plugin, um, that's based around like Lisa Jew curves called cadmium. And uh, I know he definitely saw a sales influx after Dead Mouse used it on one of his podcasts. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I mean, people will follow that, and that's that's word of mouth marketing. That's yeah. what you want. Um, yeah, it's those so. influencers. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Spawn con. <laughs> um, yeah. Speaking of um, otherworldly sounds, I was watching one of your videos on Instagram with the uh, telephonic microphone. Oh just, yeah, yeah. Uh, and you had me uh, going through Amazon looking at it, and, and I. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, this is basically like, a, it's, I don't know if it's an electromagnetic microphone or, or um, it's well, it's a magnetic induction coil. Uh -huh. So essentially, what it is is old uh, old school telephone uh, receivers that you would talk on okay. uh, would convert it would convert your voice to something that could be picked up by. Uh, magnetic induction coil and then would be, you know, processed either way. Uh, so so that's why you can... St we would suction cup to the end of the phone yeah, so you exactly. can record the phone That's exactly what it is. And okay. you can get them for, you know, under $10 hmm. uh, anywhere online. It's, it's great. Um, and the thing is that they double as a circuit sniffer. So if you put them anywhere where there's an active circuit that's creating any kind of electromagnetic noise, hmm. it does things... Uh, one kind of great example of this is um, uh, another uh, friend, Ben Lucas Boyson, who records as Hex sometimes, H-E-C-Q. Uh, -E, he did a fantastic album called Mare Nostrum, which is named after the supercomputer of the same name that is in a, uh, an old, it's either an old church or an old cathedral in Barcelona. It's this giant supercomputer. And he went there with an induction microphone and mm. picked up the incredible 
you know, induction noise from that and use that to process into an album. But you can get a lot from just, you know, going around your apartment. I mean, I made a dub techno track the other day just based on using uh, a friend's iPad, you know, just kind of I was just running the coil around on her iPad and it just worked. Hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, it was like enjoying it. And it sounded like all these noises that would you probably couldn't even really synthesize anyway. But if you could produce something in that that vein would would take quite a while a lot of playing around and you know you're just moving it around the computer and exactly yeah no it's it's fun and then yeah and you just get that inspiration hmm. so yeah i'm a big fan of techniques like that yeah so i'm actually a uh yeah there's there's another thing that i have uh coming soon about another technique that i've worked on which is uh which i encourage anyone to try which is using uh bit reduction plugins on um, very high frequencies to get sounds from foldback distortion. Hmm. So, you know, if you just set any synthesizer to give you a sign tone at 20 kilohertz um, and then throw, you know, like the Ableton Redux or any bit reduction plugin afterward and start dialing up the sample rate reduction, you'll immediately start getting the foldback distortion uh, when it exceeds the Nyquist threshold. And you get really interesting harmonic sounds from that. Mm. Um, you know, especially then if you introduce like some frequency modulation, you get really cool bass sounds and percussion sounds. And yeah, it's really interesting. Oh, that's cool. So I'm all in favor of, of you know, neat little shortcuts to sound design like that. Yeah, and you're kind of, um, I guess, exploiting the limits of like the digital technology that way. Oh, yeah. You're taking like aliasing and all these like, things that are problems technically mm -hmm. and, and using them as um, starting points or solutions, I guess. And I will say, you know, I have a huge soft spot for what was originally called glitch music, which was using a lot of those kind of, mm -hmm. which was, you know, I mean, today I think a lot of glitch is more of in the glitch hip hop vein where it's, you know, kind of micro edits and cuts and that's good too. But the original stuff where it was, you know, groups like, um, like Peter Rayberg's earlier stuff or general magic, a lot of the early stuff on Mego or Oval where it was like, you know, just taking advantage of imperfections, whether it was CD skipping or, you know, running magnets over things or Thomas Brinkman using an X-Acto knife on vinyl or, you know, any of this stuff. Uh, there's some friends of mine in, in Germany who have a project called Institut für Feinmotoik where they have eight turntables and they don't use any vinyl, but it's all just like different rubber bands and things skipping on them. And it's hmm. basically a drum circle with turntables. Um, and, and it's get, just really you get cool. Like a rhythm you know? from the spinning. Yeah, yeah exactly. Cool. Yeah, and it's just really cool that people do that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm fully in favor of you know exploiting things that aren't working properly. Yeah. So uh, once in a while, when I can catch myself before I react in frustration, you know, I, I'll yeah. when something's going wrong, I'll be like, oh wait a minute, let me let me get that and. A time this has happened to me before is um, with sometimes with a microphone. When you mm -hmm. touch the microphone and you touch something else like your computer, or, or sometimes it yep. happens with push, and it does this like weird buzz noise. And there have definitely been times when I was just about to get on my back on the floor and start moving wires around and figuring out what the hell's going wrong. But I catch myself and well, let's just record it. And, you know, it's, it's yeah, happening. Just, and, exactly. Just, just keep that for a little bit too, right? Yeah. <laughs> before you, yeah, before you, uh, before you figure out what actually happened. Yeah, I like that kind yeah. of stuff a lot. And even if it's as simple as like just background noises when you're trying to record, say, a guitar part, um, mm -hmm. let it happen. You know, like um, things, as we said, things are so lysol and clean and sterile sometimes that you know, if uh, something wants to go a little wrong, it can actually be pretty refreshing. In the context, I remember of the song. when I was in college, I wrote an ambient piece, and it was, I you know, this was before I had even bought an interface for my computer. Mm. So when I would record from my guitar into my computer in college, I would just literally I had like an eighth inch, a quarter inch to eighth inch, and I would go in through the eighth inch microphone of the computer. So super high noise threshold when you I do that. I miss those little inputs. And on the, on the, oh yeah, I mean I'm I, I have like a USB thing that restores that. For oh, when yeah. I travel, nice. Um, but you know, one of the cool things about that though is I, I noticed I was getting all this noise coming in, and I thought, okay, instead of trying to rise above it, instead, this was when I was first getting into live. It was probably live five or so at that time. I just threw uh, the Ableton Live Resonator on top of it, hmm. and I thought, oh, great, now here's a pad synth. 
<laughs> you know? So I just let my guitar just kind of do its thing and noisily distort going in and just, you know, you use that kind of the, the, the built in imperfection of that, of that wire and that input jack. Why not? You know? Yeah. And there you go. That's like, your thing now that's your secret sauce that's your your thing that maybe other people aren't doing and um and that those are humbling too (laughs) when you learn uh you know like this awesome sound actually happened because it's like half my shit's broken so (laughs) yeah oh i mean i uh uh one of the uh interviews that i did at loop last year at ableton uh the the, at ableton loop was uh juana molina which was awesome because i've loved her music for years i mean she's a fantastic songwriter and uh really just interesting uh, use of, uh, you know, lyrically and sonically interesting use of time signatures, interesting use of live looping. Her performance was incredible. Um, but one of the things was, you know, we were talking about how, uh, a lot of her previous album had been written on the road. And so during sound checks and rehearsals, and there was one song where she had done a loop that wasn't quite at the right level and had a couple little sound, you know, like little, feedback sounds in it and she tried re-recording it in the studio and it just was too sterile yeah. so she just kept it that way so there's yeah one of the songs on her you know released record was recorded on some portable field recorder somewhere that's just there and uh but that and you know it's the backbone of that song and uh the, the, the loop there and um i just thought that was really cool you know I, to I kind of embrace that. that to just say hey if that worked it worked yeah and something i try to think about a lot when i'm doing music and when i'm trying to talk about doing music which i feel like i do more than actually making music but um to have like a song like have like some sort of like characteristic or like almost like a gimmick um because i think when we have the power to do everything we want a song that has like the massive drop we want it to have the cool breakdown Mm -hmm. and it's got to chill out but it has every single element of a song that could ever exist but a lot of like the real like great songs and some of my favorites anyway have like a single defining characteristic that you can like center around and, and something like that like oh it's built off of this like kind of lousy loop that I wanted to be better but it mm-hmm. you know just stuck around. I, I think that's a great way to just to, if you can like think of your track as like this is the song that does this. It has mm-hmm. that thing you know it's it's this particular thing. Uh, I think that's like a really cool way to think about it. And um, it, it makes you save some of the other ideas for other tracks too. Like, okay, we could have the big banger oh, later, yeah. but this is going to be the one that, you know, I'm manipulating those noises that I thought were annoying initially. <laughs> and I think that was one of the nice things about making the Dial F stuff, the, the last Dial F album, was that I was able to, because I wasn't doing that in a DAW, I didn't have, I wasn't able to look at that and say, oh, that's only three tracks. I need more than that, don't I? Mm-hmm. You know, I was able to say, no, that the sound is enough and that's, that's what matters. Yeah. Uh, Cause you know, it's just a mess of virtual patch cables on a computer screen. Um, and I do think, you know, there's some music that is surprisingly stripped back that I find is really great. Uh, you know, even if it does sound quote unquote easier or something like that. Um, I mean, I really like Lorenzo Senni who, I don't know if you've listened to his stuff, but he does, uh, you know, kind of comes from a, a background with trance music and has a lot of tracks that are just one synthesizer. It's like one trance lead going crazy. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, you know, it's very stripped back, but it's, you know, the kind of the audacity to do that is part of what makes it so cool. Yeah. Uh, and I would say, um, uh, you know, I feel the same way about uh, Katarina Barbieri's album from this year. There's a lot of stuff there that's very focused and more stripped back. Um, Caitlin Raleigh Smith too has some pieces that are just, you know, a bucle easel, uh, the late Charles Cohen did the same thing. And, you know, you're just kind of like, oh, this can really stand on its own. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm often inspired by artists where I think, can they get away with that? Are you allowed to do that? <laughs> like two, two that I often come to for that are a uh, hieroglyphic being and actress. Cause I'm often hearing tracks from them where it's like, at first I'm thinking, no, no, like you can't. You, oh, but they did it, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it works and it's awesome and it's, it's, it's great and it's, it's unique um, and it sticks with me. So yeah, you can. <laughs> That's a little bit of the artistic experience, I think, is like, right. can you get away with that? Are you allowed to do that? You know, mm-hmm. testing the boundaries and seeing what you can do with it. So that's, that's fun. And 
Yeah, like it. It's like safer maybe to make a piece of music that has like your maybe your intelligent melodies and you know mm-hmm. interesting layering of all this new gear and you're pushing technology. But sometimes it's like, nah, this this thing I did like this, and you're not yeah. supposed to. Screw it. <laughs> right. <laughs> that exactly. rebellious thing, doing what you're not supposed to do, like a little kid or something. Yeah, the wrong feels right. Yeah. <laughs> That's fun. Um, you may make me want to like bust out some music now, <laughs> which is great. Yeah. Well, what what uh, I'm looking at the the stuff you've got behind you that looks like an MS20, and mm-hmm. is that a sub 37? Yes, this is the MS20 nice. Mini, um, mm-hmm. which I bought wood sides for. <laughs> uh, nice. <laughs> Sounds warm right now. And yeah, <laughs> this is the the sub fatty. Um, mm-hmm. Speaking of like things that are like a little broken that sound cool is um, this is a, a Moog realistic synthesizer Concertmate MG20. Uh, the, MG1, that's I'm the sorry. Radio Shack one, right? Yes. Yeah, realistic. Yeah. <laughs> this, it's got like these like little sliders on it. Like the caps always come off. And, but I, from what I understand, when you open it up, they had this like kind of foam in like I, I don't know, like this foam, like protective thing, but it disintegrates over the years and turns into like a gunky, gluey Oof. kind of thing, and it's caused the synth. Like if I do the filter, you mm-hmm. know, you'll be doing your filter, and then it'll just static out, and now the filter's just open all of a sudden, and then it closes, and and like depending on how you wiggle that little slider, you know, mm-hmm. but I, it's like broken perfectly. You know what I mean? Right, yeah. It's like, broken in the inspiring way. Yes, it is. So like yeah. you, you can just turn on like white noise and use it to like make like swells and then like, you know, like there's this like d- noise and I, I'll probably have to clean it out one day. You know, I watched mm-hmm. some videos about that. But right now where it is, like it's it's broken yeah. perfectly. <laughs> well, and that's the, the story of, uh, if you ever listen to Paul, the story of his first three albums one, two, and three was the, and the story of the name that he took as an artist was that he had a Waldorf uh, four pole filtered module that he dropped down the stairs or something like that. And uh, it just made these weird wheezes and pops afterward that were all over those first three albums. Hmm. Um, And the funniest thing uh, that I heard from him in a talk he gave once was that uh, apparently Waldorf contacted him to offer to repair it at one point. And he thought, no, are you nuts? That's my sound. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's perfect the way it is now. <laughs> it's so. fixed now. It's not broken. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Once in a while you get lucky where things break in a cool way. <laughs> mm-hmm. I guess that's like um, at the heart of like circuit bending, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's something I, I just bought a soldering iron actually. Um, oh. Because I thought I needed to fix a guitar input, but... Mm-hmm. Suddenly, it's working now that I have the soldering iron. I don't know, <laughs> but, um, but I was thinking like I got like some old toys that I don't use, like old you know toy keyboards that I bought. And it's just like let's try reconnecting things. I have no idea at all about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I've soldered like five things in my life, so it might be a fun just <laughs> what the hell. Yeah. Let's see what happens. I mean, I gathered what you want to do is just open it up and try manually putting in different patch points until you get something interesting and then solder those, right? Yeah, so, I guess, right? Just yeah. reconnect things. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, that's why you do it with toys, right? So you're not yeah. <laughs> destroying something too expensive. Yeah. But yeah, no, people love that stuff. Mm. So yeah, I've uh, yeah, I've never actually done, I'm, I'm a klutz with a soldering iron, so I've never done the kind of a circuit bending thing. But uh I do like kind of doing stuff improperly in the virtual realm as well. Yeah. You know, whether or not I fully understand what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Um, I did see a friend recently who was doing something akin to circuit bending using uh, Gen, which is the kind of machine uh, runtime environment in uh, uh, within Max MSP. So I, I would have no idea, you know, how to actually do that properly. I would just be going in and deleting things and saying, hey, does this do something? (laughs) <laughs> but yeah. well, but you can really get to that. So I think sometimes yeah. your your ignorance is your friend too. You know, or right? You'll yeah. do things that you're just not supposed to do, and get lucky. You know. Oh, totally. Well, I yeah. What was it I was reading about the other day? Um, oh, that that song by the Go Go's. Our lips are sealed. 
mm-hmm. that the combination of chords um, that uh, uh, the bass player from the Go-Go's who wrote it, the guitar player who was classically trained had told her, you know, no one with any classical training would ever put those chords together. It's completely incorrect and, you know, like almost dissonant. But it became a hit single because, and it does sound, you know, interesting when you listen to it. You're like, yeah, there isn't a lot that sounds like it. Right. Uh, but they turned that into pop music because, you know, the songwriter did not have that classical training. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was really interesting to think about. I had that experience as a kid. Um, I was taking my guitar lessons and I was trying to teach one of my friends to play guitar just so I could solo over his chords, you know, <laughs> and, <laughs> nice. uh, you know, showed him a couple power chords basically. And then like a day or two later, he like came over and he's like, oh, check this out. Look what I did. And he was like pulling on the power chords, like bending them uh-huh. in this little thing he made and, and playing chords that weren't in any key that I ever knew. And uh, I was just like, kind of like, it was, a, it was a really good moment for me actually, where it taught me like, you can learn from everybody, you know, like, Oh, yeah. I think I was like at that point, you know, when you're a kid and you're learning and you're like, oh, I kind of know something now. And you start to get like a little <laughs> snobbish. Uh, and it just knocked me right off of that. And I was like, oh, wow. Like, you know, the reason he did that is because he didn't know that he's not supposed to. And, exactly. Yeah. And it just, it helped me realize like, pay attention and learn, you know, and don't get, don't let your knowledge kind of uh, box you in. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah, because if yeah, if all you know how to do is you know if, if you only ever do things the quote unquote right way, uh, you know it, it it can get boring after a while. <laughs> yeah, so, I've read yeah. about like the Beatles. They'd ask George Martin what they're supposed to do, and then they'd change it. I think, oh yeah, I think like huh. um, I want to hold your hand ends on like a major sixth chord. If I'm thinking of the right song. Oh, and um, it's not uh, <laughs> not supposed to do that. Yeah. 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 So like. There, there was like, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. But they're like, but it, it leaves you hanging in like this really nice way. So, yeah, and, you know, now it's like just a classic sound. But that's the like uh, purposely breaking the rule or doing what you're not supposed to do because you don't know you're not supposed to do it. <laughs> oh yeah, no, totally. Um, no, I mean I've definitely done that with uh, whenever it comes to patching. Uh, when I work in Max or in Super Collider, uh, it always, I know I'm doing things that are, you know, were I a more efficient programmer, I wouldn't be doing. Mm-hmm. But it works for me and it ends up sounding a little bit different. And I like that, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I have a whole folder of sequencers that I tried to build in Max that I wanted to sound like one thing specifically and just consistently failed. But each of the failures was something interesting and each of those failures has its own yield. Yeah. So, you know, embrace that and kind of move with it, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point um, to just remember, even though you might not be getting, kind of like what you said about the cover songs, you might not be getting exactly what you want, but you're, you're mm-hmm. finding new things. If you can remember not to get frustrated that you're not getting exactly what you're intended. Right. Well, and I, you know, and I think that kind of, I mean, that's the, a lot of the history of electronic music, some of the most brilliant moments are that. I mean, you know, let's remember... As is often cited, that the the Roland TB three hundred three was originally supposed to mimic a, an, a, an electric bass, yeah. <laughs> which it was horrible at doing. And if that's all anyone had ever tried to do with it, it would have remained a cheap thing that got kicked to pawn shops. Yeah, but you it know, went up real cheap because <laughs> yeah, because Future and uh, a bunch of other people in Chicago thought, well, you know, what if we just tweak the hell out of it? Mm. Wow, there you go. There's acid. <laughs> yeah, auto tune even. You know, like. The oh yeah, creators of Auto Tune were like, no one would ever want that setting. The instant. Yeah, they fiction. wanted it subtle, yeah. and then share proved otherwise. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. I mean. Uh, I mean. Absolutely. No. I mean. It's. It's fun to. Uh, what was it? I saw a while ago. There was uh, this glitch artist, John Satram, who did a uh, a video where he made music using sound soap, which is literally it's a uh, it's it's software that's designed to kind of clean up noisy or clicky tape or vinyl recordings but by applying really extreme settings he was able to kind of make it create something Mm. you know and it's just really interesting like no one would think of sound soap as an instrument but why not you know well that um what was it i was just at the mix con in new york Mm -hmm. um the guy from isotope was there uh jonathan i forget his last name sorry oh yeah but um he was speaking about um 
uh, Iris, how that came about. And it came about because people were talking about RX, you know, clean the spectral cleaning that you can do. Right. And they were like, you should make a synthesizer out of this because people were using that for sound design, I guess, much like sound soap, you know, not what it's intended for. And then they came up with Iris. Um, fun, fun thing that just happened to kind of connect us all together here. Uh, they're offering Iris now for free if you buy it. I anything. saw that. Yeah, which is an incredible deal. I yeah, love Iris. I think it's probably my boutique. favorite thing they've done. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I well, yeah. Never, Have you never tried it before? No, I've I've seen oh. it, you know, and like been like, oh, that's kind of cool, you know, up my alley a bit. But, um, you know, never shelled out for it. And um, I I saw that deal. I was like, great. And what I wound up buying was a Sign Vibes plug-in. I got... Uh, uh, luminous that's just nice. like a shimmer reverb which is yes yeah super cool so it's like such a score you know to like things so i haven't gone into iris yet this is just like the other day but um yeah it's just fun to think like that happened because somebody was misusing something else and you know, yeah absolutely not reading the manual or something <laughs> oh yeah i mean you know there's um the sure level lock compressor which you can get as a plugin from uh, Sound Toys. They call it Devil Lock. Is this incredibly harsh, gritty compressor that a lot of people love? Actually, is like a parallel thing on drums, on mm -hmm. on overheads especially. And uh, that came about. Uh, I believe the Sure Level Lock was originally uh, like a talkback mic. It was it was designed for basically. Mm -hmm. Like so, if you're a producer talking back to people, but someone had the idea, like, hey, let's run some other things through it and see what it does. You know. And hey, the results speak for themselves. Yeah, so. wasn't there like I want to say maybe like Phil Collins did that back in the eighties? Oh, oh interesting. Was that what he talk back mic? Mm -hmm. They they recorded I drums. Have, or that something would make like, sense. You know? So, yeah, so yeah. I have a vague memory of reading something about that. Some consoles yeah. mic, you know, and they couldn't get it yeah. to sound better than it coming out of that. <laughs> well, and it's interesting how you know how much we pay now for plugins that recreate the imperfections that engineers used to absolutely abhor. Yeah. So, you know, like that that Brainworks SSL console plugin that I use has modeled noise per channel that you can control the level of. And I'm thinking, you know, console noise used to be the thing that producers had to play this delicate ballet with how much they could jack up the levels and how much they could compress because, you know, if the console noise got too much, you were you had to go back and remix it. Mm. Um, and now we love it, you know. Yeah. And all of these nonlinearities of tube and solid state circuitry that, again, people didn't like because it wasn't reliable. We love that now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and we're already seeing plugins like uh, Goodhertz has a plugin called Lossy that models uh, packet loss that you would get with MP3 compressors. So it's basically like using a subpar MP3 encoder from the mid 90s on your sounds. Right. Um, and, you know, going back to Stefan Goldman's book about presets again, he has an interview with uh, this artist, Corey Archangel who says, you know, they're, they're talking over Skype at that point, and Corey Archangel says, you know, look, give it 10 or 15 years, and there's going to be a plugin that models the dropouts and the weird sound of the Skype connection that we have right now. <laughs> so, you know, whatever it is that's annoying people about technology right now that they're trying to yeah. circumvent or overcome will become a feature yeah. at some point. Well, we'll have, like, some weird warm feeling for it. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Right? Why not? Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, well, I, yeah, I mean, look at all the plugins that are tape yeah. or vintage digital or whatever these days. You know, yeah. we miss it. I've so. recorded my synths through VHS tapes, cassette tapes, micro cassette tapes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it, I, I fight the perfection of the computer quite often with all the things I, mean, I used to hate. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I think of when I was growing up, we had a collection of videotapes, uh, some of which had been recorded off of HBO. And one that I watched all the time was the first Ninja Turtles movie. Mm-hmm. And I'd watched it so much that the tape was just wobbly and warped in points. And I kind of think like, dang, I wish I had that recorded tape right now so that I could sample some of those moments where it's like, you know, that's the soundtrack circa 1990 or whatever, um, you know, and I'd be watching it in like 93 with just this wobbly, wobbly VHS sound that I would love to capture, you yeah. know. But at the time, of course, it was, oh, it's annoying. It's not perfect. Right. Yeah. So, Yeah. Maybe that's because you can always just watch the perfect version of the Ninja Turtles if you ever really need it. And oh, yeah. No, I think that's what it is. I mean, that's why we love vinyl. I mean, I 
totally admit to it. I love vinyl. I love listening to it. And I love something that's been mastered well on vinyl, really cranking it and hearing that kind of sound to it. But it's also, you know, I have digital backups of everything so that I can take it with me on my phone so that I've got it in case something were to happen to the physical product. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, now that we have the availability of perfection, we like to have the imperfection as an option. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. We're funny like that, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know. Well, David, this has been really good talking to you. Um, we've, Absolutely, we've man. We've come up on some time here. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Um, anything you want to leave people with? Anything you're working on? Or um, do you want to send people a certain place to check out some of your work? We got the band camp. Yeah. I mean, there's uh, DHLA.me is my kind of homepage. And then there's, yeah, there's the band camp, the Dial F band camp. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, no, it's been great to be here, man. Uh, I mean, I guess what else, what else I'm working on right now, I've got a few short films coming, uh, uh, another album at some point. And then, yeah, working with, uh, Sensel, like we spoke about the morph mm-hmm. and uh, a few others that I can't talk about yet, but, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it's been good, man. Cool. Yeah. Well, thanks all for right. all you're doing and, um, thanks for taking the time to talk. Mm-hmm. And thank you everyone out there for listening. So thank um, you for listening. I hope you appreciated it. Yeah, I, I think they will. I know I did at least. So excellent. <laughs> we got one happy customer. <laughs> All right. All right. Excellent. Have a good day, everybody. Take care. Take care.